Uh, uh, we're continuing in our study on the spiritual gifts. We've been going through this book of, in 1 Corinthians. And so at this time, I want to invite you to take out your Bibles, if you have them, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Of course, those of you that are tuning in online, you'll also be able to see the words there on your screen. Of course, they're posted here as well. I always try to encourage people to bring your Bibles, if you can, or whatever devices you use. It's a way for us to get engaged. And, and sometimes I like to mark up my, my Bible and, or uh, you make notes and devices and so forth, just to, whatever the Lord's been stirring in my heart to, to write down. But we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 11. We've gone through this passage the last number of weeks, but we're going to stick in it today, and we're going to just plow through into the next uh, spiritual gift this morning. But here we are in verse 1 of chapter 12. Paul says this, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. I know we just prayed a moment ago, but I think we can pray once again as we commit this time to the Lord. Lord, we just want to thank you for this day that we can honor and praise you. We thank you, God, for your marvelous grace. Your mercies are new every morning, and we just want to praise you, God, that, that you delight in this time as we worship you. And so, Lord, we pray that as we hear your word and as we receive your word, that we would be obedient to you and that we would be faithful stewards of all that you've entrusted to us. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, today I would like to talk on the seventh spiritual gift that is listed here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, specifically the discerning of spirits, which is found here in verse 11. Now, I will say that this is a very useful gift, but frankly, they all are very useful. Uh, but I want to just highlight the importance, really, of this gift because it enables individuals and churches to keep things on track, to keep things in order. And I would say that we especially need this today, to keep things in alignment with God's Word. We need this discerning of spirits. Now, the word discern means to recognize and distinguish between. To recognize and distinguish between. And so, spiritual discernment is a kind of direct perception that is given by the Holy Spirit to discern what is controlling a particular person or what is governing a certain ministry. It's an ability to discern by God's grace, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, what is motivating a person as they're doing ministry or speaking. Now really you could say that there are three options or three sources by which a person can be motivated. The first operation could be led of the Holy Spirit. And ultimately that's what we all should desire that we would be led of the Holy Spirit at all times. So we can be led of the Holy Spirit, or a person can be led of the flesh. And incidentally, for those, of, for, for those who are not Christians and those who are not following Jesus Christ, they do not have the Spirit indwelling them, and so they're operating according to the flesh. And frankly, as Christians, it's possible for us as well to operate not according to the Spirit, but according to the flesh. You could call this the human spirit. And the third and final source by which a person can be motivated by is the demonic. 
those are fallen and rebellious angels. Now, obviously, that is not something we want to be motivated by. Uh, we don't want to be motivated by the flesh or by any type of demonic force at all. So with, there are three options. We can be spirit-led, we can be led of the flesh or the human spirit, or one can be led by demonic forces. And so when it comes to the kingdom of God, uh, no real spiritual fruit can happen unless we are led of the Holy Spirit. If we're being led of the flesh or any other source, that is not going to produce anything really of eternal significance. And so it's critically important that we as Christians learn how to be led of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to potentially talk about that in, in days and weeks and months ahead, but we want to be guided by the Spirit. Now notice here, you might not see the translation so well in the English, but the gift of discernings of spirits of spirit is mentioned in the plural. This means like miracles and healings, each discerning is an operation of this particular gift. And so like the other spiritual gifts, this discernment comes only under God's control. We cannot discern these things by ourselves. We need God's help. We need the leading of the Holy Spirit. We need God to govern us, and He will lead us to show us how we can discern each situation. And so this is an extremely beneficial gift. You know, it's interesting, during the Civil War in, here in America, uh, often the, the cavalry was sent out ahead of the troops to be able to go on a, a reconnaissance mission to be able to see the enemy's movements, to be able to see how it was that the enemy was moving throughout the terrain. They would be able to survey the landscape of the area and get a picture of what was really going on. And you could say that like reconnaissance missions of the old cavalry, I shouldn't say calv uh, cavalry, it's, cal it's not cavalry, but cavalry. Spiritual discernment enables people with this gift to know what is really going on. To supernaturally perceive the spirit by which a person is operating in a given moment. Whether it is discerning a prophetic word, or the motives of one's hearts, or just seeing things from a supernatural perspective... Uh, this is something that we as Christians need. And, and certainly this gift of discernment can happen in several different ways. For example, we see sometimes in Scripture that spiritual discernment came in the form of a vision. Now, I will say that this was more rare in the Scripture, but it did happen. For example, we see John the Baptist in John chapter 1, verses 32 and 34, that he, he was given spiritual discernment at Jesus' baptism. He saw the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus in the form of a dove. But other people there who were present apparently did not see this. So John was given spiritual discernment to see what was really going on at Jesus' baptism. He was given a vision in that way. Another example where a vision, somebody was shown something, was John the Revelator in the book of Revelation, how he was granted many visions of what the Lord was doing there as he received this on the island of Patmos. He was given the vision of three unclean spirits that came out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. He mentions this in Revelation chapter 16. We don't have time to dive into that particular passage this morning, but John the Revelator was given supernatural insight, was given visions by the Lord to discern what was going on in the nations around him and what he would see that one day would happen. And so these men had clear visions of what was not there in the natural. In other words, the natural eye could not see these things. They were given discernment and vision was the, the modus of operation by which God chose to give them that insight. Another way spiritual discernment can happen is that people can perceive by the Holy Spirit what is going on in the spiritual realm. Uh, things like uh, the influences of satanic activity. Uh, I've known people and I've seen people and there are people in Scripture that, that have this gift that are, are able to discern what is not only going on in the spiritual realm, 
but also how one, one that they're talking with is confronted and being motivated by perhaps demonic type of activity. And so they're able to discern whether or not something is demonic or just something that just simply has emotional or psychological factors. And so oftentimes when people are given these insights, it often is buttressed with a, a, the gifting of prayer and intercession to be able to pray and to pull down those strongholds to see that there is a release by the power of the Holy Spirit. A.B. Simpson, who is the founder of the Alliance, once said that he could feel demon powers attack when he was on board a ship and nearing heathen land. It's interestingly enough, as, he's an, as a missionary, several different occasions as he was coming to that foreign nation and he knew was in, involved in, in pagan idolatry, he could sense these forces of darkness as he was about to enter into preach in that nation. And sometimes people with this gift can discern influences of not only demonic activity, but God's ministering angels as well. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 27. I want to give you an example here where this was evidenced in uh, Acts chapter 27, verses 21 through 26. This is where the Apostle Paul himself sees an angel. And just to kind of set this story up, he's been sailing uh, with uh, sails to Rome, and there's been storms on the sea, and he's with the other prisoners on the ship. And listen to what he says. He says, Since they've been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on some island. So again, Paul, the Apostle Paul, was receiving this insight as the angel appeared to him and he was able to recognize, this is certainly by God's guidance, what would take place in that situation, namely that no one would perish. Now we also know that this spiritual gift of discernment also can be given to test prophecies. You remember last week I shared with you on this gift of prophecy, and I mentioned to you that I wanted to share several ways in which we can discern together about how we can know whether or not something is from the Lord or not, to see some, whether or not somebody is really speaking on behalf of the Lord, or if they are operating according to the flesh, or worse yet, if it's from the enemy. Several things I want to just mention regarding this subject matter. First of all, how do we test prophecies? Uh, first of all, as well, uh, not only should people with the specific gift of discernment be able to do this, but we as Christians in a general sense need to have this gift of discernment. Let me give you another example of that. You think of the gift of evangelism. While some of us may not have the gift of evangelism, we're all still called to evangelize, aren't we? We're, we might all, not all have the gift of intercession, but we still should all intercede, shouldn't we? And so even if we do not specifically consider ourselves having this spiritual gift of discernment, we all should have some measure of discernment as Christians and grow in it. So how do we test prophecies? Well, several things I want to just ask. I think it's important for us to ask ourselves whenever we hear somebody share something that they believe God was saying to them. First of all, does it line up with the Word of God? Does it line up with the Word of God? This is why it's critically important as Christians that we know the Word of God because I've shared many different occasions that the Holy Spirit, He does not contradict Himself. He will not say one thing in the Word of God and say something completely different today. He doesn't give us new doctrine. We have everything that we need for training in righteousness and God's Word here. And so we need to understand thoroughly and meditate on God's Word, and study His Word, and show ourselves approved unto God in that way. So does what, what is being said, does it line up in a way that's consistent with the Word of God and the character of God? 
understanding who he is and his nature. Another question we have to ask ourselves is, is it a timely word that produces godly fruit? Does it produce the fruit of righteousness? Does it produce fruit, as I've shared with you before, that talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth? Is it going to produce, is it that producing in our spirits and in our minds? Because if it is, it's likely, and it certainly is, the Holy Spirit, because He will produce that fruit. However, if it is producing confusion, if it is producing doubt or anger or this, this unsettled feeling in the sense that we do not feel right in our spirit, that is something we need to pay attention to. What kind of fruit is being produced through what has been said? A third thing we have to ask ourselves is, is it redemptive? In other words, is it meant to draw people back to the heart of God? You know, one of the greatest ways in which Satan tries to attack people is to condemn people. To condemn, to make people feel like they're not worth, worth anything. To make them feel like losers. To, to get them defeated. And so one of the attacks of Satan is to condemn people. But one of the things in which the Holy Spirit does is he convicts us, which is a difference from condemnation. But that conviction is meant to draw us towards God. Condemnation drives us away from God. So what, if you're sensing or if there's somebody sharing something with you as far as what they felt like the Lord is saying, the question we have to ask is, is it producing something that is redemptive? In other words, does it make me want to draw near to Jesus? Does it make me want to draw closer to Jesus? Because incidentally, anything that comes of the Holy Spirit will always glorify Jesus. It will always point to Him. The Holy Spirit, He does that. It will never drive us away from Him. And finally, another question we should ask is, is the person operating by the Holy Spirit? Or is there another motive of this person, maybe for recognition or for pride? And again, this is where the spirit of discernment is going to come into play. Because these are not things that we can perceive naturally. We need guidance by the Holy Spirit. And so the gift of discernment gives us the ability to be able to pass correct judgment on prophetic utterances, to discern whether or not something is of the Holy Spirit, to see whether or not it is of the human spirit or of another spirit such as the demonic. You know, this week actually somebody asked me an important question related to some of these matters regarding prophecies, and I want to just kind of address this real quickly because it is a worthy question. So he, this person asked me, does, this person, does the person need to say, thus says the Lord, in order for it to be a legitimate prophecy? My opinion is that it doesn't have to be announced. If the Lord is in the particular word or statement, then he will use it to bring about his intended purpose, and it would be a prophetic word from the Lord. In some ways, it might be better not to announce, thus says the Lord, and just let the Lord do His work, and furthermore, it might be safer to do that. But in the event that someone does say, thus says the Lord, I don't have a problem with it as long as it is from the Lord. So I, I want to just make that clear, because some people ask, well, does it have to be stated? I don't believe it's necessary. Just let, if you just feel like the Lord's saying something in your heart, just, just share. You know, I'm just sensing that you know, we need to read this passage of Scripture, and the Lord's been speaking through this, and we don't have to necessarily say, thus says the Lord, but there are times where maybe the Lord has us do that. So I want to just make that very clear. I don't believe it's necessary, but it certainly is appropriate if it indeed is of the Lord. And I also believe that one of the most urgent needs in the church today is that we be theologically literate, we be biblically astute, and sufficiently led of the Holy Spirit in order to be able to effectively judge and evaluate both the source and the meanings of dreams and visions and all kind of subjective impressions such as prophecies. <clears throat> you know, last year, uh, what greatly troubled me is what I saw in the church and online is the abuse of the prophetic, particularly as it relates to election predictions. And I'm not, I'm not attempting to be political here today, but I will say that a lot of things that I saw online were wrong. And sadly, what passed as prophetic 
was nothing more than self-willfulness or wishful thinking. And since many of these prophecies missed it, somehow these prophets want to kind of spiritualize things and wiggle their way out of what they really said. And when confronted, many of them did not show a real sign of repentance. And as the prophets and people that claim to speak on behalf of the Lord, they, if they don't repent, it just shows that there's not a spirit of Christ within them if they're not humbling themselves. Now, I'm, I welcome being able to say, Lord, what is it you're saying to the church today? I welcome to be able to say, Lord, I want to hear, speak, for your servant is listening. We don't want to criticize that altogether, but I will say as well that I'm, I've been saddened by the abuse that I've seen this past year. And I would like to encourage humility. You know, in fact, some of these other, uh, some people that said these things and, and confessed their sin of saying, you know, I was wrong, other spiritual leaders began to condemn them for repenting. It, and it acted in sort of a way as an indictment to their own spiritual pride. You know, there, there's a couple of years ago that went to a church service and uh, after the serv- they're having a time of ministry after the service and there was a man who supposedly had this gift of prophecy and these people were coming forward at the end. So this couple, after the service, were wanting to be prayed for. And so the husband went forward and was prayed for by this, this man and, and later on the, the, in the service, the, the wife went up to be prayed for by the same man and they came out to the car after the service and uh, the, the husband and wife sat together in the front seat and they said, I'm so excited. And they both shared about what this man said. The one man said, we, he, he said that the Lord had called us to go to China as missionaries. And the wife said, well, that's interesting because the Lord spoke to this man that we're called to be missionaries to Indonesia. And they were confused. Well, we're supposed to be missionaries, but... What are we supposed to do? So they went back into the church and they, they went back up to the, the pastor who had shared these things at the end of the service. And he said, well, God is calling you to Indochina. And they thought, this is crazy. <laughs> and I, I will say this, what is going on today is a lot of Indochina stuff trying to take things that weren't right and trying to spiritualize it. Listen, if it's of the Lord, it's going to be right I want to make sure that we don't try to explain things away. Yes, I'm all for hearing, want to hearing from the Lord. But we don't need prophets who are trying to explain away their errors. What we need really is a spirit of humility and repentance, which is the spirit of Jesus. And this is why we as Christians need this gift of discernment so badly, especially in these times. Dr. T.J. McCrossan, who was an alliance worker years ago, he said, you will feel at once that it is not of God. It will be harsh and repelling, and your spiritual nature will revolt. Carrie Judd Montgomery, who was another former alliance worker, she said, God's people need to pray for discernment. If they will wait on the Lord, he will give them discernment by the power of the Holy Spirit, and they will know at once when the enemy is trying to counterfeit the work of the Holy Spirit. So people with this gifting of discerning of spirits, again, can be led in many different ways. They can be led through visions, through impressions, through various leadings. But this gift must be cultivated and grown. Incidentally, all the gifts of the Spirit can be cultivated and grown. Listen to what Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, says in chapter 5, verse 14. He says, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of their of their discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So this verse, in this particular verse, talks about that discernment can be trained, it can be cultivated to be able to discern between good and evil. And again, this gift, like all the other gifts, can be cultivated. They should be matured as we grow in faith. And sadly, some churches just rigidly stick to their own agenda following their own program, never open to deviating from their own set plans and programs, forgetting sometimes that Jesus makes it very clear in John chapter 3, verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, 
and you hear its sound, and you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so is everyone who is born of the Holy Spirit. Friends, it's, it's critically important that we as Christians, yes, certainly there's a, a, a place for planning and preparing, but we need sometimes at being led of the Holy Spirit to put those plans aside and say, God, what is it you want to do here and now? I believe God works through planning, but there are times when God disrupts our plans and says, you know what, I'm going to break in and do something new that you didn't expect, but you need to be open to the leading of my spirit. And I've seen in worship services where there are times where certainly we offer our praises before the Lord. We, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Yet there are moments where the Holy Spirit is leading us to receive perhaps a healing or a breakthrough in our own lives. And people with this gift of discernment know God's timing and leading in every moment. You know, think about an eagle. An eagle soars. One of the things that an eagle will do when it's perched up on a ledge is it waits for the time where the wind can carry and it opens its wings and it soars. It lets the, wing, the, the wind carry it. Sometimes we try, sometimes as church is trying to flap things together and trying to get some lift off when we just need to be led of the Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, would you have your way in our midst and discern what, how it is He's leaning. Now, certainly we can't do simply things on a whim just simply because something fits on a program, but we need to be led of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus operated Himself in this gift regularly. In fact, in John chapter 2, verse 24, it says that Jesus knew all people. In other words, that he saw what was in the hearts of all people. The Holy Spirit showed him very often what was in the thoughts of the people that he was talking to. Jesus could see how demons influenced the natural realm. You think of that in Matthew chapter 9 and 12 as he's confronting people. Jesus discerned at times where a demon was causing a person to be deaf or to be mute. And he rebuked that evil spirit and they would be healed. And so Jesus consistently operated in this gifting of discernings of spirit. We never see Jesus being deceived by people. You know, in the book of Acts, we see that the early church regularly operated in this gifting of discerning of spirits. For example, Peter and the Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, as you understand that story, Simon had long dominated the city of Samaria with his witchcraft and, and sorcery. And when he heard Philip preach the gospel, he saw miracles and signs that he performed by the Holy Spirit. And Simon was baptized and became a disciple or follower of Jesus Christ. But when he saw John and Peter come down and pray for people to receive the Holy Spirit, Simon wanted this gift and he said he'd pay them money in order to be able to receive it. And Peter could discern what was going on in his heart, saw his crookedness saw his selfish motives in this because he had spiritual discernment. He was able to see what was going on in Simon's heart. Turn with me, if you will, to another example in Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 18. Another example where the early church operated regularly in this gifting of discernings of spirits. Verse 16 of chapter 16. Paul, this is Paul and Silas in prison. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She, she followed Paul and us, crying out, These men, our servants, are the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Now, just a pause here. Today, a lot of churches would make this girl a prophet or a prophetess. What she said wasn't wrong, was it? Again, it's not just what's, what they're saying, but it's the spirit that is operating this, what's going on here. Verse 18, and she kept doing this for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. And of course, as you hear the rest of the story, they were thrown in, in jail because her owner was losing wages on what, she was, her, what the, her business was and fortune-telling and so forth. And so these two men were persecuted as a result of following Jesus. 
But again, they operated according to the discerning of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me, if you will, once again to Matthew chapter 16. This is a passage of Scripture that I think will unlock a lot of our understanding of what this gifting of discernment means. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 23. I'm going to read a little bit of a passage here, but it's really something incredible. It says in verse 13, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and the others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said, or Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon's bar Jonah, for flesh and blood had not revealed this to you, but my, my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strict, strictly charged his disciples, to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I share this passage because it's actually a very insightful passage about how Jesus operated, and incidentally, how we as Christians should operate it as well. Notice that Jesus calls one man by three distinct names in this passage that I just read here. First of all, he calls this man Simon, we refer to him as Simon Peter, but Simon literally means a reed. Sometimes it can be referred to as, as hearing, but we see in verses 16 and 17, Jesus calls him Simon Bar-Jonah, or Simon, son of Jonah. So Simon means reed, something unstable. Notice as well that when Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter speaks up and he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus could recognize that it was the Holy Spirit that was showing Peter, or Simon, those very words. And then he calls him Peter, Petros, which means rock. And on this rock I will build my church. And later in the next chapter, Jesus explains that he's going to have to be crucified. And Simon Peter, Peter, the big rock, rocky, uh, it says, oh, Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Isn't that fascinating? One man, three distinct names. What that shows me is that Jesus had the ability to discern what was going on in one person at, exact, at every exact moment. He had the ability to discern them when they were unstable, to celebrate them when they were of the Lord, and to rebuke them when they were of the devil, all by maintaining the same level of love for him. And friends, we need this same kind of discernment to be able to say, you know what, that's Christ speaking through you now. Or no, that's your flesh talking. Or no, that's the enemy. Because if we don't have this type of discernment as Christians, Satan will use people we like to shift us from the purposes of God because we're not listening to our enemies anyway. You know, we have a tendency as humans to categorize people. Okay, this is Kyle. I like Kyle. Everything Kyle says is good. Oh, Kenny, man, you can't trust one thing Kenny says. Sally, you know, she's a good woman. You, she just is a trustworthy woman. Jane, she's, she's no good. So we have a tendency to, to put people into categories. And the danger with that approach is that we, we often put people on such a pedestal that we don't recognize that at any given moment they can fall. Think, for example, of Ravi Zacharias. 
There are times one can speak of the Holy Spirit, but be led of Satan in another moment. We must discern at every moment how a person is being led. And again, we have to be careful not to put people on a pedestal that they can never go wrong. Even the most spiritual people can operate in the flesh or succumb to the enemy's devices. Think of Martin Luther. I've been reading a biography of Martin Luther back in the the 16th century, the great reformer who spoke of abuses within the church and caused the Protestant Reformation. Later in his life, spoke harshly against the Jews. Anti-Semitic words that were used later by Hitler. Now, there are some people that can say, well, Martin Luther at the very end of his life recanted those words that he said, but they were in writing as a result. Here was a man who was led of the Holy Spirit in a lot of ways, but in that moment, in his, that writing, it was not of the Holy Spirit. So this is how we need to understand that there are, there are times we have to recognize what is the Spirit being manifested in a person. I can remember one particular time where I was going through a real difficult time as just in ministry and as a pastor, and I was just feeling just the attack of Satan. I remember telling my wife, I just want to die. I just want to drive my car and hit a semi. And my wife said to me, Tim, that is the devil speaking to you right now. And she's right. She could discern in that moment of my weakness, where I was discouraged and feeling depressed, she could say that wasn't the Spirit of Christ. We have to be able to discern things at every given moment. And the truth is, all of us have our moments of weakness. So be warned, we're never above falling. But we must let the Holy Spirit govern us at every moment. This is why we're commanded in Scripture to be continually filled with the Spirit. To continually be guided by the Holy Spirit and not according to the flesh or the enemy. We need discernment of spirits. And this is especially important as as far as who we're looking to for spiritual guidance or counsel. And hear me well, it is possible to be doctrinally right and spiritually wrong at the same time. It is possible to be doctrinally right and spiritually wrong at the same time. Let me give you an example in the scripture. A hot topic in Jesus' day was resurrection of the body. The Pharisees believed in it. The Sadducees didn't. That's why they were Sadducee. God forgive me. You probably heard that before. So Pharisees believed in the resurrection. Sadducees did not. And Jesus himself affirms resurrection in Matthew chapter 22. And it's ironic that the Pharisees were doctrinally right. But they missed the presence of the Messiah in their midst. I'm all for doctrinal purity, but doctrinal purity must be met, matched with people that are led of the Holy Spirit. At every given moment, yes, we all have our moments, but this is why we need to cling to Jesus, that he's the vine and we are the branches. This is not something that's just for a public ministry. This is for private displays we're getting before the Lord and in our families and and our friendships. There must be a consistent way in which we abide in Jesus and look to him. Again, these Pharisees were doctrinally right concerning the resurrection But Jesus called them whitewashed tombs because they were poor and wretched inside. You know, Bible knowledge is very important and we need Bible knowledge for discernment. But it must also be supernaturally infused by the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, even the devil knows Scripture. And he seeks to use it to twist it as he did with Jesus as he was tempted in the wilderness. We need to know Scripture, but we need to know the Spirit of Christ who guides us and leads us according to the Word of God. And just a few other things I want to add here. I want to just caution you today as I've seen in the last 25 years, particularly with the dawning of the Internet, a lot of discernment ministry sites that I actually find to be quite bogus. And again, there's a place for discernment in ministry, and we need discernment in ministry. But I've, I've discovered that a lot of these sites salivate at the next person they can take down or expose. Is that the Spirit of Christ? Is that redemptive? 
And worse, these ministries often come to different conclusions. You could go to one site and find this person under the discernment ministry that will have a different conclusion with somebody else who supposedly has this discerning gift. Again, the Holy Spirit, he doesn't contradict himself. Some people think that they have a discerning spirit, but the reality is, is what they have is a critical spirit that is demonic in nature. A critical spirit operating under the guise of discernment. Friends, we need discernment of discernment ministries. We need to be led of the Holy Spirit in all these things. And not only know the Word of God, but know the Spirit of God. And be careful that we do not operate in a critical spirit, thinking that we have a gift of discernment so it needs to be displayed. We need to be led of the Holy Spirit. I don't know, maybe if in a person in your, life, in your life right now or somebody you thought of that you've wanted to approach to discuss a particular issue. Maybe you have a friend in your life or a family member that has caused you some pain or problems. And you've wanted to approach this person about a particular matter, but you've been afraid and there's anxiety that kind of creeps up in your heart and mind whenever you approach them. I have discovered... That if, if this is often the case in your life, as far as when you're afraid to approach a person, oftentimes there can be a spiritual power that's operating in that person's life and maybe trying to attack you. Whether it be a spirit of manipulation, a controlling spirit, a spirit of pride, a narcissistic spirit. Again, your enemy is not that person, but it's those forces that are using that person and attacking them. Friends, we need to be discerning. And as I said here earlier, this is something that we can grow in as believers in Jesus Christ. And I think it's incredibly fitting that as we come before the Lord and say, God, would you give me a true spirit of discernment to discern what is going on not only in my life, that I would be set free from any areas of bondage in my life, but Lord, that I would be used as an intercessor to pray for others and to be able to not attack people, but to love people as you love them to bring them back to the heart of God as I too am returning back to the heart of God. You know, as the worship team comes forward at this time, what I want to just remind us here is that when discernment operates in the church correctly, remarkable ministry follows, both in the church and in the world. <laughs> We need that gift of discernment, the power to distinguish between what is true and what is false. Not just what is true and what is false, but what is true and almost true. Because that's where real discernment can really be needed. A.B. Simpson said it this way. He said, encouraged, encouraged others, or he, A.B. Simpson encouraged others to seek this gift of discernment particularly. And friends, we need, to, we need to seek the Lord for this gift. And Clayhouse, don't let the enemy use the abuse of spiritual gifts as kind of scarecrows to keep us away from the genuine blessing. A.W. Tosher said it this way. He said, I want all that God has for me. You know, friends, the way we fight false fire is with true fire. God, would you grant us a spirit of discernment? I want to just invite you to stand your feet. Just to ask you to bow your heads and pray with me right now. We're just going to, maybe if this is the desire of your heart, if you want to just, if you feel comfortable, want to just lift your hands out before the Lord, either up or before the Lord, say, God, I need this a spirit of discernment in my life. God, we need you, Jesus. We need you. And Lord, we cannot have real discernment apart from you. And we cannot have real discernment apart from your Holy Spirit. So Spirit of God, point us to Jesus. Show us how we can honor you. Show us how we can praise you in all things. And how we can love people as you've called us to love them. Lord, we ask for a gift of discernment. Lord, I pray for that person here today that is in a real tough spot is not sure what to do or what decision to make right now. I pray that you give them the spirit of Christ to discern 
your will and your way. Give them your leading, Lord, that they would discern your way. That you may be glorified, Jesus, and that you alone will be praised. God, we need you. We cannot do this without you. We cannot do anything apart from you. God, would you grant us a spirit of discernment. Lord, I pray that for each of us as individuals. I pray this collectively for this church. Lord, we're so frail. We're humans, Lord. But we come to you stupid. And we say we need you. God, you are our God. And you alone will we put our trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.